there's something about belonging to Jesus and not belonging to the world, not quite fitting in, not quite being willing to play the game 100% that makes Christians, I think, very distasteful for a lot of people in the world. Hello and welcome to the show. This is Teresa Yanaris. Today we have a very, very special interview with Dr. Thomas D. Williams. He is a 2018 Visiting Research Fellow for the Center of Ethics and Culture at Notre Dame University, has written widely on theology, philosophy, ethics, and spirituality, and his 15 books include Who is My Neighbor, Personalism and the Foundations of Human Rights, and The World as It Could Be, Catholic Social Thought for a New Generation. Williams teaches theology at St. John's University on the Rome campus and has done extensive media work serving as consultant and commentator on faith ethics and religion for NBC, CBS, and Sky News in the UK. He was appointed by the Holy See as spokesman for the Synod of Bishops in 97 and in 2001. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for being here today. It is such a pleasure to be on your show, Teresa. Thank you. Absolutely. I am so excited to talk to you today. First of all, to, for all of my listeners out here, we are going to be talking mainly about his new book, The Coming Christian Persecution. It's a great book. I'm going to drop a link in the description where you can get this on Sophia Institute Press. Uh, so let's talk about your book. First things first, I like to start with definitions because I find that that is the just the best way to, to foundationally start in some of these more complex topics. Can you explain what is persecution of Christians? Sure, absolutely. I love definitions too. Um, <laughs> I mean, persecution, <clears throat> excuse me, in the very strongest sense is bloody. It is violence. It is aggression against another person, that kind of persecution. But in a much broader sense, if you just take up uh, the Merriam-Webster's uh, dictionary, it will tell you that it is oppression, it is discrimination, it is harassment, it takes many, many different forms. So in the book, I try to distinguish between these. What are the real, what are parts of the world where Christians are violently persecuted, where they're shedding their blood uh, for believing in Jesus, and in other places where life is made more difficult for them, where they are harassed or marginalized because of their faith. Uh, but both in some way fit under this larger tent of, of persecution. Thank you for that. Excellent definition. On this topic, I think this would be actually a good point to kind of skip ahead in my list here because you brought something up that sparked my interest. I'd love to hear you talk for a minute on the difference between and the definitions of red martyrdom versus white martyrdom. Oh, yeah, this is a good one, too. Uh, so obviously, in the first centuries of Christianity, there were red martyrdom is in, in, in just a few words is blood, right? Red martyrdom is called red martyrdom because it means the shedding of one's blood. And for example, among the first popes, so many of them were martyrs. So many are saints because they were martyred. In fact, the original saints of the church, the ones that were declared saints, were all martyrs. It was only later on when the church started saying, well, this person lived a really holy life. Maybe they weren't killed. But I think probably they deserved that title as well, and it expanded to include other people that live very holy lives. But that sort of persecution, that sort of bloody persecution, those who gave their life for Christ, it was obviously much more common in the first three centuries under the Roman Empire than it became later on, especially with Christendom and, and throughout Europe and places that were much more friendly to Christianity. Uh, so that's the, red martyrdom is that original classic sense of martyrdom. A martyr in um, in Greek simply means witness. It's one who bears witness. And red martyrdom is is bearing witness up to the shedding of one's blood, giving one's life for Christ. White martyrdom was first used uh, for hermits and uh, the desert monks. It was those who lived very, very aesthetic lives, who lived a lot of suffering in their lives, voluntarily assumed, out of love for Christ. They did not die. They did not shed their blood. But they lived in a way that was very close to, to the example that Christ gave. And it was something that they opted for. And nowadays, we use white martyrdom, especially to refer to those who take a lot of abuse for the name of Christ, but they don't necessarily shed their blood for him. I think this is such a fascinating arena that you're talking about. It, it blows my mind how relevant this topic is today, especially given the culture that we live in, especially online, the digital era where everything in this society these days is about uh, victimization. There's so much, especially with the, the younger generations and the confusion over uh, identity and really what it means to take abuse. I think there's a lot of confusion around abuse, uh, about the concept of abuse, really. And so I, I think it's just really interesting 
like the, the part of this conversation that you're stepping into as a Christian and targeting that specific arena, especially given the amount of persecution that Christians experience online. And I want to unpack a lot more of that. But first, I'd like to ask just generally, can you give us a little bit of a scope here? So let's talk a little bit about statistics and blow this out into what are we looking at right now as far as how are Christians actually being persecuted worldwide now? That's a, that's a great one because that puts everything in a, in, a, in a really good global perspective. I think of all the statistics that are out there, and there are many, 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 I think if we take two, it will distill the whole question down and, and give people, give your viewers and, and listeners a real sense of, of the breadth of this problem. The first statistic is the number of Christians who suffer bloody persecution right now in the world. Those who fear every day of, for violent aggression. And there are some 360 million worldwide who live under that definition, who every day are, are under a threat, under risk of actually suffering bodily damage or even death because of the name of Jesus and because of their identity as Christians, which is really, uh, when I first saw that number, uh, and it's been growing actually over the last year since I've been really investigating this topic, it really blew my mind. That's That's bigger than the population of the entire United States that many worldwide live under oppressive regimes or oppressive situations where they really have to fear for their lives. The second statistic is equally telling, I think, which is that of all the people in the world who suffer and are persecuted because of their faith, three out of four of those are Christians. So we hear a lot about anti-Semitism, which is a real problem. We hear a lot about Islamophobia, which is a real problem. These are real things. But to remember that 75% of the people in the world who suffer and are persecuted because of their faith, 75% of those are Christians. So if, if, if someone is being persecuted for their faith, odds are that person is a Christian in the world today. And I think those two statistics put side by side give us a real sense of the magnitude of the problem. Thank you for that. So that leads us right into the main question here. If you think about it, right, the question would become why? Why is it then that Christians are so persecuted? Why is it that 75% of the persecution happening here is toward Christianity? Well, that, that is a big question. In fact, I spend a fair amount of the book analyzing that and different responses that have been given historically, trying to explain or explain away uh, why Christians were persecuted, especially in the early centuries. Um, a lot of it, I think, really has to do with um, following Jesus. He said, you know, the, the theological answer to this is, if they if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. A disciple is not greater than his master. Um, if they loved me, they would have loved you. And if you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. But since my choice has removed you from the world, therefore the world hates you. There's something about belonging to Jesus and not belonging to the world, not quite fitting in, not quite being willing to play the game 100% that makes Christians, I think, very tasteful, distasteful for a lot of people in the world. Sometimes, a lot of times, this takes the form of simply that Christians have a higher allegiance. So if you have totalitarian regimes, if you go somewhere like China or North Korea, where you have atheistic communism reigning, and you have a group of people that has allegiance, pledges allegiance to a higher power that is not the state and says, my first allegiance is to my God, you are already a threat in some way to that regime and to that state. And so you are someone who is already under suspicion, if not some sort of, of active hostility. In other parts of the world, like in the West, and this is, I think, the scariest part of at least my research, is how fast persecution is growing in the post-Christian West, uh, it takes the form most often of radical secularism, where Christianity looks like an obstacle to what many people consider progress. So if you still cling to biblical morality, if you still cling to the idea that men are men and women are women and marriage is marriage and life is life and these basic truths that Christians uh, basically take for granted, then you are in some way obscurantist. You are clinging, as I say, to an, a Bronze Age mentality, to a Bronze Age book. Uh, and, and really the world is not is no longer comfortable with that. That has, we've moved beyond that. We no longer see that. The human being is more malleable than that, we think nowadays. And so you're just getting in the way. And that getting in the way quickly becomes, you have to be removed. Mm -hmm. And I, we're gonna continue to unpack this question of why as we go along here. I, I love that you pointed out particularly the post-Christian, post-modern 
culture that we're living in and its unique issues when it comes to standing against Christianity. I think something to bring up here is the concept of the, especially in America, you have this kind of attitude of everything needs to feel really good right? Mm -hmm. Everything is this feel good kind of spiritual, but not religious. We don't really want to have boundaries. We don't really want to speak against anything. We really just want to accept. But what that does is it muddies all the waters. Morality is completely confused. Even reality is confused. There's no capital T to your truth. It's your truth versus my truth. And the whole thing kind of starts to fall apart. And so this side of really as Christians, we're not called to live like everything's going to be perfect in your life. And everything's going to be butterflies and rainbows. No, that's not actually true. Like we're a lot of times we're called to suffer for our faith. And so I think that that's, that's a really critical part of this conversation. When you look at how people just want to feel good all the time, right. In this world, but then you look at when you lift your eyes to the eternal and you're not looking at the physical, you're keeping your eyes locked on the unseen versus the seen this the conversation completely shifts can you speak to this this part of the conversation for a little bit well absolutely and that's why you know really uh, the world if you're speaking of the world this this very secularized world doesn't hate all christians it only takes christians it hates christians who take their faith really seriously and refuse to accommodate and refuse to simply mirror the so the society that they they live in those who are countercultural, those who really take the teachings of Jesus very seriously. And for those, you get to start, you start seeing a real problem. Um, I'll, I'll give you just one very concrete example of this uh, from a couple of years ago. Remember when Amy Coney Barrett was first appointed to a district court? And really, all the, the Senate Judiciary Committee, when they started questioning her, it became more and more aggressive and became more and more focused on her faith became more and more, so much so that, that Diane Feinstein famously said, you know, I, I get a sense that the dogma lives loudly in you. Um, but the reason I bring this up too is because one of the ones who was harshest with her was Senator Dick Durbin, who himself claims to be Catholic, but obviously he's a Catholic who is pro-abortion, pro-gay marriage, pro, he, he does mirror that society. He is His faith doesn't cause him any problems in accepting where the world is going, but someone like Amy Barrett does. You know, that becomes the problem, those who really want to actively uh, live out their Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Excellent answer. I'd love to ask you to talk a little bit about media coverage of this issue. How is the media covering this issue? That That is hugely important because I, I one of the primary theses of this book is that the drivers of Christian persecution are getting stronger and their traditional bastions against Christian persecution are getting weaker. And that's why the thesis of the book is that the Christian persecution is getting worse and it's not getting better, right? And so we, we can talk about the drivers, but right now you're asking me about that resistance. And part of the resistance is knowing what's going on. And I'm guessing even among your viewers who are very well-informed people that are up on their faith or up on the news, most do not realize the extent and the magnitude of the problem of Christian persecution in the world, simply because they're not getting it. You're, if you pick up the New York Times, you're not going to find it. If you pick up the Chicago Tribune, you're not going to find it. If you watch CNN, you're not going to find it. And many times, if, even if you watch Fox News, you're not going to necessarily see it. There, there's so much going on that's simply not covered. Uh, and sometimes I think this is just out of ignorance. Sometimes I think uh, it might be a little bit more out of malice. I think there are a lot of people who work in the media who do not want to show what Christians suffer because they don't want any sympathy for Christians because they see Christians where they live as being part of the problem and not part of the solution. So why draw attention to Christians who are suffering for their faith and make them look like good guys? And I think that that is some of the underlying malice that explains why Christian Christian persecution is so so little covered in the West today. So a large part of my viewers are, they've left the occult and the new age and they have tethered their lives to Christ. They've gone, most of them, a lot of them through very radical conversion experiences. And often they are the only Christian in their household around people that are very angry toward Christianity, either for uh, reasons of spiritual abuse or um, a lot of these people also come from like conspiracy media backgrounds, right? And so they're not looking at mainstream media. They believe uh, religious institutions to be control constructs that are oppressive. Um, and so when it, when you get into that postmodern and even occultic belief systems, 
it it really it's interesting to see what these people go through because really they're they are also persecuted in their homes for their faith i watch a lot of the mostly women and they're they're having to lean into their faith alone and without the support of their family and their friends and often there's a lot of uh hatred actually toward what they're following because of the distortions the disinformation the misinformation out there that's so powerful on the media and also because of censorship of what's really going on and so uh, i i intimately understand um the the persecution side of what you're talking about in this particular demographic because i think it manifests differently depending on what demographic we're talking about uh do you have any experience uh considering kind of these ex-occultic uh, people that experience persecution. Have you heard about this? Have you seen this? I, I, I have heard about it. And, and and I and I'm really glad you brought this up because there are a couple points that tie into this really, really well and are very important. One is that a very, very aggressive group, aggressive anti-Christian group, are neo-atheists. This neo-atheist movement that we're seeing, you, you've seen the slew of books over the last 20 years with you know, I mean, I could give you, you know the list very well as I do. I call them the God slayers. But the funny thing is. Uh, the hatred towards something you don't believe in. It, it seems like you would just ignore it if you don't believe in it. You know, I don't I don't go writing about ogres and, you know, uh, centaurs and things that, you know, I don't believe in. Um, but there is an aggressive hatred. And I think it's it's more a rejection of God in a way more than a, a true disbelief. Uh, there's a hatred there. There's there's something that's burning and that's very aggressive. And I think that that explains in part that kind of persecution uh, especially experienced among those who convert to Christianity and embrace that, they are looked upon as traitors, as betrayers, as and they have they have gone over to something that uh, that many in this group feel to be very foul and to be very ugly and to be very uh, hateful. Um, a second thing about this is really really important is that is the whole question of spiritual warfare. Uh, I think you're talking about a lot of your viewers and listeners are people who have experienced this in their own flesh in their own lives. Uh, that this is more than just a human thing. This is more than just person to person. This is about forces uh, that are beyond us, occult forces, demonic forces. And this is something as Christians that we simply believe in. We know this to be true. And that spiritual warfare that goes on uh, has real repercussions in the world we live in. And that hatred of God begins with Satan. It really does. It doesn't begin in the, in the heart of a human being. It begins in, with the devil. And I think that this is something that envy that the devil feels towards God, I think is especially burning when someone comes over to Christ, because it's as if the devil lost someone that he thought he thought he held for his own. I'm really glad you brought that up. And I think that it's it's something that's so important for these people to remind themselves of. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, you know, but, and because they've had these these just transformative experiences in Christ and, and they've seen things because of the, the extraordinary um, experience that they've, they've seen of Satan. They've actually experienced demonic oppression at times, even demonic possession. They've experienced things that a very small percentage of the world has actually experienced. So they carry very, very powerful testimonies and I believe that Satan hates them a lot because of how powerful their testimonies are. And you see them leaning into their faith because they know it's true. They have such a, a faith because of what they've experienced. They can't deny it. And so it's such a bright light that you start to see the friends and family go after time, you know, after persecution, they go, well, wait, wait a second. This isn't just the next thing. Because a lot of times the first thing is they say, oh, this is just the next world religion that they're trying on like a hat and then they realize after time that's not actually the case that it's for real and then they start to go well maybe i need to look at this a little bit deeper and you start to see the conversions happen in the families and the friend groups and so because god is delivering people in droves out of the occult usually tapping one person in these family systems on the shoulder you see that spiritual warfare hit that individual person really, really hard because they're alone. It's easier when it's isolated, right? But if it's power in numbers, now the enemy is less powerful because people can stand together and community and friendship is so uh, important about this. I'd love to ask you, do you have any advice for perhaps some of the people in this situation? Um, perhaps there are particular media outlets that you could uh, 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 offer to them maybe that would be useful for them in sharing information to their friends and family about Christian persecution? 
Well, I, I think um, one thing, just going back a little bit in your question, um, I, I think I, I would hope that that your your viewers and your listeners feel emboldened by the very fact that God is using them so beautifully. Um, and it's painful because a lot of it involves suffering uh, on a personal level, especially before these conversions happen. But you're chosen not just for yourself, but for others as well. And that that witness to what God has done for you and in you becomes then, as you were saying, Teresa, a bright light for, for so many other people. And that also helps to explain the, the intense hatred of demonic forces against you, because not only are you saved, not only are you coming into the light, but you become then a, a light for so many other people. And I would just hope that you know, your listeners really do feel that they do have a community. It might not be in their immediate family. It might not be the people that live right around or nearest to them, but so many other Christians who we have to pray for each other. We have to stand shoulder to shoulder. We have to give each other courage because that's the only way to be, you know, have the strength to stand up to, uh, to these forces and to be able to live out the vocation that God is asking of us. You know, there's that very beautiful line from Tertullian in the, in the second century, which is that the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians, that it's really that suffering, that persecution that ends up being then such a force for conversion. It brings so many people into the fold uh, to, to follow Christ. And that doesn't mean necessarily martyrdom only in the sense of dying all the way, but martyrdom of of whatever sort of persecution you happen to be facing ends up being really, really a tool for God, a, a means of grace for so many other people. It's a witness. Like when you are willing to suffer for something, people see that and they have to stop and go, well, why? Why would a person actually do that? Like when you look at this present darkness as just a temporal reality and and you're locked on the hope of Jesus Christ coming back your your vision's locked on the cross the suffering in this temporal reality it's just temporary and and for people that are enduring such intense suffering that speaks so loudly i mean you look in the bible you see it in the bible with with that but then also like you're talking about like your whole thing you're you're talking about in this book is like that's not just something that happened back then the holy spirit is moving today that's not just something that's in a in the book right it's it's today right. it's now and and that i think it can be really easy for people to sort of distance themselves from these concepts and think that perhaps that's like a chapter in a, in the past but but i think your work is so important because it actually brings awareness to the concept that no not only is it did it happen then and it's happening today but there's a purpose for that and and you're actually pointing forward about what's to come through this that it's not just about the awareness of now but what comes next can you speak to that sure i was i was just recently uh just recently in france in the in the burgundy region and and doing a lot of uh, looking at kind of the wake of the French Revolution, which a lot of people don't know, but was very, very anti-Christian. The, the French Revolution itself, in part because the church and the state were, were considered kind of together, and so hatred of the crown was also hatred of the church. But there was a real virulence in attacking monasteries and attacking, there was a real cancel culture. And I was really struck by how similar that time was in this age of so-called enlightenment, when you were trying to replace superstition and faith and religion, which they all lumped together as if they were the same thing, with this new worship of reason, of, of, of humanism, something with devoid of God, devoid of, of faith, and how the other had to be completely stamped out for this uh, enlightenment to be born. And I think that we're living in a very, very similar time where there is a belief that this, you know, science and progress and these things and the transhumanism that we celebrate today and, and we're not any more conditioned even by our own bodies. Now our biological makeup is not even something that, that holds us or restrains us. And in the face of all that, faith again gets in the way. Faith is the enemy. Faith that reminds us, no, actually, that's not the way you're created. That's not who you are. That's not the meaning of your existence. Uh, and, and those reminders of the truth of who we are and why we are here and how we are loved and how we are to love becomes really kind of a slap in the face, if you will, to those who are trying to put forward a different agenda. And I think that there is kind of a cyclical nature to all this. 
because we see this ebb and flow in history. And right now we're we're really at, uh, I think, an ebb. We're at, uh, sorry, at a, at a time when it's cresting, if you will, when you're really seeing a rebirth of this very, very violent, uh, aggressive form of anti-Christianism. Yeah, I'd love to hear how have you been treated in pioneering this material and entering into this very hostile political environment with this material. I'd love to hear you talk about your personal experience here. Well, it, it's interesting. I it, My experience has been very broad in the sense are those who are very grateful and obviously who, who think more along the same lines and are very happy to know that this is, is being talked about. There are those who are very aggressively against it. And they will often originally in, in the beginning use subtle forms of ridicule, of joking. Uh, and it's you know, oh, uh, whining Christians or kind of putting down the idea of, you know, oh, you're just, oh, you're going to be the newest victims. You're going to be the, the things that you were talking about earlier, when that is not what we want to be, by the way. That is not how we see ourselves. And that is not because we believe that Christ already won the final victory. That that victory is already ours. We're not victims. We're victors in him. But at the same time, we do have something real to suffer during this earthly pilgrimage on our way to our final union with him. And I think that, so you get you get a lot of uh, a lot of that kind of ridicule, a lot of uh, disbelief. Those who say, "Aren't you exaggerating? You know, is that that's not really anything like you know the suffering of the past. You you live a very comfortable, easy life, especially in the West." And to a large part, that's true. But it's more in the lens, you know, as you were saying before, what we see coming immediately on the horizon. There's already signs of it all around us, and it's not slowing down. It's accelerating, and this is something that that is growing. Um, just I'll close with one kind of little example of this that I found fascinating, honestly. So Wikipedia, I put this in the book, you might have seen it. Wikipedia actually has an entire entry on what they call the Christian persecution complex. And they talk about how many Christians imagine Christian persecution to go, be going on so that they feel closer to Jesus. And they explain how this is all kind of a psychological, a pseudo-spiritual thing. And I was just thinking to myself when I first read this, I was aghast. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. But then I thought, can you imagine if Wikipedia put up an entry about anti-Semitic complex? Oh, those whining Jews complaining about people not liking Jews. Can you imagine the way that would be received? Or if you put in, a again, a Islamophobic complex, as if this isn't, of course, real. This is just what some people have going on in their minds. You know, people would be, would be up in arms. And yet we can accept it. When it's Christians, you can say, oh, yeah, because it doesn't really exist. Gaslighting at the finest degree, really. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so how might Christians being persecuted handle this in a way that glorifies God? This is um, this is actually my favorite chapter of the book is the final chapter. It's a little bit more spiritual. It's a little once we've looked at all the facts and the figures and how everything looks, how we as Christians are meant to embrace this and, and live it out. And and I think that there's a whole gamut of virtues that we are called to cultivate in our lives, whether it be courage to stand fast and, and you know, praying for the grace not to betray Jesus when it gets really, really tough to be able to stand firm in our faith, uh, whether it be just that aspect of prayer, prayer both for ourselves, watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. One of the temptations, obviously, is to cave, uh, praying also for our persecuted brothers and sisters, being really there their backbone, you know, carrying their cause before our Lord and asking him to watch over them in a special way. Uh, whether it be loving one's enemies, these very, very hard demands of the gospel, when Jesus says, bless those who persecute you. Uh, our response is not the sword. Our response is not, I'll persecute you back. I'll fight you back. I'll one-up you. It is praying for our persecutors, loving our enemies, and loving those who do harm to us in whatever way it may be. And at the same time, and this is kind of paradoxical, but it's but it's true and it's very important, also fighting for religious liberty. And it's not a question of fighting for privileges. It's not a question of fighting for, I want special treatment. It is fighting for the freedom of people to worship in peace and to be able to love God and practice their faith in private and in public and not be treated as second-class citizens because of their belief in Jesus and their adherence to, to his truth. Uh, so these are some of the ways I think that we're called upon to really live out our faith under persecution in ways that are both, they strengthen us and they pr provide witness, I think, for other people as well. 
Great answer. Thank you for that. And I think something that uh, obviously you and I both have a heart for is education and raising awareness. And I think that this can also be really empowering for the people that I work with coming out of the occult and getting reformed out of an occult worldview, anchoring into a Christian worldview, going through that process, learning how to then share their testimony, right? But then also they've come through experiences that equip them to be able to speak into very specific arenas where Christians need help raising awareness and teaching others. And I love that you're doing this so well in your book. I loved how you go through the history. You talk about different issues. It's so useful because for people that are being persecuted or uh, it, ar across the board on different things, you've provided an account where people can go cherry pick statistics that might be useful for them to, to enter into those conversations. And that's part of uh, my passion too in Spirit Sanctified, the blog that we run that educates and teaches. Um, to offer things that people can then take and share with others. I think that's a really important part. I'd love to hear you speak to that um, in your mission here and what you're doing and, and your motivation for doing what you're doing. Yeah, I, I, education, I agree with you. You and I uh, do, do share that completely. Um, it's so essential because so many people have the right instinctive reaction to things. Their intuitions are good, but they don't have a lot of data to be able to back it up. So in an argument where somebody questions them or pushes back a little bit, they don't know what to say. And, and the only way really is, is to have the facts and figures to know what's going on, to be able to respond and say, well, you know, I don't think so because look at this case and look at this case and look what's happening here and, and what about this? And then people realize that it's not just, you know, kind of a, an intuition or a feeling, but really something that people understand the facts about what is going on. I, I think that's absolutely essential. And that doesn't take away from, you know, Jesus's admonition to us not to prepare our defense and let the Holy Spirit speak for us. I mean, we can't prepare, you know, for, for th that kind of thing. It, it just happens. But we can be armed with the knowledge that we're called to have. I, I think we would be on our part negligence not to know enough to be able to at least say, well, no, there's this and this and this. And to be able to also gently give people facts that might make them reconsider their positions. You know, this is something also that opens doors. If it's not done in a hostile way, it's not a question of winning an argument. It's a question also of providing other people with interesting and, and thought-provoking facts and ideas that help them to rethink the problem. Absolutely. And planting seeds. I love that. You know, it's not, uh, I love how you said it's not about winning an argument, right? But we can, we can share useful and interesting information. And sometimes it's in that way that people will go, okay, maybe I need to look a little bit deeper at this. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Thank you for your work. I would love to give you a chance to talk about what you're up to now, what's next for you, where we can find you on social media. Thanks, Teresa. Well, I uh, I have a website, www.thomasdwilliams.com. That's a good one, and where this book and other books I've written are, are available. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at TD Williams Rome. So Rome, as you kind of see in the background, that's where I am been living for many, many years, enjoying the beauties of Italy. Um, and I'm working, I'm continuing honestly to work on this topic right now. I'm I'm trying to take it in different directions. The book is now done, it just came out in March. But um, I'm going to be doing some speaking, some public speaking on this question for a while because I don't want to just write the book and then move on quickly to something. I'd really like to be able to flesh it out and give people a chance to really engage this. Um, and because I think there needs to be a movement. It needs to, it needs to be not just a book and not just you know one or two people, but many people that realize how problematic this is and, and that it really demands a response. Well, keep me in the loop at, and how I can support you. Um, I think what you're doing is extremely important. So uh, really, I will be praying for your ministry here. Thank and, you, Teresa, and likewise. It, it's really cool. It's cool you live in Rome. I have to say, I'm going to Rome in a week. And I'm really oh excited. So tell me about Rome. You've been there. How long have you been in Rome? I've been in Rome since 1991. So a very, very, very long time. Probably more time than most of your listeners have been alive. And why did you why yeah. did you move to Rome? Tell tell us about how, why you moved to Rome. I was an exchange student. I came here as a student, and I kind of fell in love with it. And uh, it's funny because I when I I remember when I was smaller, and people would talk about going to Europe and visiting Europe. I used to think, why would anybody want to go to Europe? And then and then what happens is I come to Europe and I fall completely in love with it. And uh, I mean, I love my country, and I go back to the U.S. often. 
Uh, I'm not one of these embittered expats that, you know, in some way has a grudge against their, their home country. I love my country. But Europe is very, very beautiful and very special. And there's something about it. I love languages and I love culture uh, and the different things that are here. And also, you know, this is a wake up call to me, too, because this is this is more post-Christian uh, than the U.S. is. And it, it's kind of, I think, an alarm bell also for us as Americans that we can lose what we have very easily. In fact, if we see the changes in the last few years, just in the growth of agnosticism and the growth of these nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, those who have no affiliation or belief, it's it's happening quickly. And I don't want it to look like Europe in terms of the faith panorama or the faith uh, landscape. I'd really like America to keep that great religious and Christian soul that it's had and, and really explains in many ways its greatness. Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Okay, so I have a little bit of a, a pop culture question for you. So I learned about you that in 2002 and 2003, you served as a theological consultant to Mel Gibson for the making of Passion of the Christ. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, that was that was awesome. Honestly, it was so beautiful. I had to pinch myself. Um, it was, first of all, he's, he's a very interesting character, a, a little crazy, but you know, I, I'm very indulgent in the sense that a lot of geniuses and artistic genius in, in particular, you get a little bit of crazy. If you didn't, you wouldn't have the kind of imagination that's necessary to do the amazing things that he has done. And working with him, honestly, his faith moved me very, very deeply. He believed that making the Passion of the Christ was the, the work of his lifetime. It was his crowning achievement was making this life this this movie about the central act of Christ's life which was giving his life uh and offering it up for all of us and and he made it in such an intensely personal way he really wanted and I remember so many things that he would say because people would say isn't that a little violent isn't that a little too much and he said I'm just tired of looking at plastic crucifixes with the nice little white ivory body and everything looks so nice and antiseptic. It wasn't like that. It was, it was terrible. It was hard. And so working with him and I just found it exhilarating to tell you the truth. I found it and very, very moving and very, very helpful for my own faith. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting to consider because suffering is such a critical part. And I think that the Roman Catholic church gets this right. Roman Catholic church, Anglicans, Orthodox, like there, there's so many communions that get this right, that, that are real about this, that it's not just about this, like fog machines, butterflies and rainbows, everything's supposed to be perfect in your life, antiseptic sort of Christianity. Cause really that's not the way that Jesus walked. He walked through a, a tremendous, more suffering than any one of us can imagine. Right. And so I, I just think that your, your pulse on this issue is spot on and it's incredibly important, especially in a world where I think su the concept of suffering is really under attack in general. So thank you so much for your work. This is Dr. Thomas D. Williams. His book is The Coming Christian Persecution. We're going to drop the uh, link to this in the description. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Teresa, it was a joy talking with you. I have to, even though it's a dire and, and sobering topic, it was beautiful to, to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. You'll have to come on again. Gladly. Take care.